Okay, we're live. We are going to go over the uh, a conference they had on nuclear weapons and UFOs at the National Press Club. So I haven't seen this. I've heard a few things about it. So let us get into this. Let me make this a little bigger. Oh, no. Uh, hold on a second, guys. Let me see if I can... Um, let, me, let me rewind this. All right. Sorry about that. Let's do this full screen. Let's get over... Uh, they're probably going to... If they do introductory stuff, I'm just going to skip over that. If you don't mind, and let's uh, get into this. Uh, Trying to prove uh, that, uh, uh, well, whatever uh, we want, uh, you might think it's uh, simply uh, relaying the information that we have, the truth as we know it, and, um, and those facts. And, as we know them. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, we'll just refer to these objects as UFOs. Uh, we've given a handout. Uh, I don't think the handouts are here, but we will give handouts uh, of signed affidavits of other witnesses and biographies. And I'll begin with a I'll very, begin with a very, with a very, with a very, with a very brief history. Uh, uh, going back to 1945, so we'll begin with the testimony of... Now remember, UFO phenomenon goes back into ancient times, um, and long, you can find UFO phenomenon in medieval Japan and medieval Europe, and, and you can see it in Josephus and sort of things, but for the modern times... Uh, they usually start it in 1945. Lieutenant J.G. Bud Clem, uh, U.S. Navy, um, while well, he was stationed at Naval Air Station Pasco, Pasco Washington. And um, how that goes not coming for me. With, with thanks to uh, Robert Hastings. And uh, uh, so I'll just play this, uh, which we just, we just got recently. That yeah, goes not for me. Cotton on wings, Cotton on wings down, down in Corpus Christi, Texas, Texas, in 1944. May the 15th. We were, we were called to again. Echo is not for me. Investigate a object that was flying over the or moving around over the Hanford Ordnance Works. Uh, the object had been detected on a radar down in. A, uh, next to the Columbia River, just west of uh, the Naval Air Station there at Pasco. When we got down there, they told us that this bogey was out there right over the Hanford Ordnance Works and directed uh, Lieutenant Commander Brown to take off and challenge him. Henson C.T. Neal from South Carolina uh, and I stayed on the ground. C.T. went down and got in another F-6F to back up uh, Brown if he needed it. And I went up to the control tower to relay the information from the radar office to Brown. And we talked back and forth. Uh, we got Brown up there behind this object and we asked him what, what he saw. He said, all I can see is a bright red or reddish orange uh, fireball right up in front of me. There's no form, no uh, substance to it whatsoever, just a bright light. At the time he started in after it, uh, the radar man estimated that the uh, speed was probably around 60 to 70 knots, okay? Translated as uh, miles per hour, that's probably 65 to 75, 76 uh, miles an hour. But when Brown got behind it, it started moving away and he kept getting closer and 
firing up that F-65 faster and faster and faster. But anyway, when he did that, the object, whatever it was, just took off and went boom, boom. Just clear out of sight, no noise. And the car, he wouldn't have heard it in the F-65. If there no, noise no noise is something to but that, uh, make note of. Off and left him, and uh, he circled up there uh, for, oh, I would say probably half hour, maybe three quarters of an hour. Nothing ever happened again, but it had headed off into the northwest towards Seattle. So can you tell me a little bit more about what the object looked like? Hey, all that object was was a fireball. Uh, and uh, Commander Brown said that he couldn't figure out what it was. He said it was so bright he couldn't hardly stand it when he was getting closer to it. But he said he soon got out of range where it, it was nothing more than just a ball of light. There was no form or no uh, noise to it that, that he could detect. But the worst part of all of this is that my rock book never showed our experience, and I don't know yet why, but the, the Navy ignored that, or at least did not tell anybody about that and didn't put anything in my log book so I could refer back to it and know what night it was that we flew. But anyway, it was something else. Okay, that was uh, Lieutenant J.G. Bud Clem uh, telling his uh, story about early 1945. In mid-1945, uh, there was another incident uh, at the Hanford site called the Hanford Ordnance Site. And by the way, uh, this site was used to produce plutonium for the first atomic bombs. And uh, this incident, uh, of Lieutenant Commander Roland Powell, a highly decorated World War II pilot, uh, was sent out to intercept uh, a UFO uh, that was, again, detected on radar. He chased what he described as a, having a saucer-like appearance, bright, extremely fast, with a sort of vapor enveloping it. It climbed to an altitude of 65,000 feet and then just hovered. Uh, his aircraft- uh, It's very high for the time. Uh, had a ceiling of 42,000 feet, so he couldn't do much about it. Um, again, I'll note that the, this incident occurred in mid-July of 1945, and the first atomic bomb test was July 16th, 1945. And that test used plutonium as its fissile material. I'll move on to 1947, uh, very famous Roswell crash. Actually, there were one near Corona, New Mexico, the other uh, on the plains of San Agustin, about 150 miles to the west of Corona. Uh, Roswell Army Airfield, Airfield was the home of the 509th Bomber Wing, and that was the bombers that uh, dropped uh, bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. And it, at this time, was the only operational atomic base in the country. Uh, Initially, the first crash was announced by um, what you see here. Uh, Colonel William Blanchard authorized his public information officer, Lieutenant Walter Hyde. out uh, to go ahead and get uh, release this as a press release and oh I'm muted thank you uh, Daily record thank you Paul uh, saucer um, I was just saying I'm not really sure we can know for any certainty uh, what the what the UFO stuff was in Roswell so uh, I've heard anything from weather balloons to Japanese balloons that were going to cause fires in World War II that they picked up remnants of, uh, it, who knows? 
Uh, I'm skeptical of claims. Uh, Jacques Vallée would probably be the best person uh, to know. They have, Jacques Vallée mentions that they pick up remnants of some UFOs um, in his interview with um, with his inner because he has inside knowledge of governmental workings and stuff, and I trust him more than any other person with that Bob Lazar with the secret research guy and and stuff like that. So they could be covering up a whole host of things um, in. Uh, in Roswell, so we don't know exactly what it is. Recovered. Um, and uh, even though there were, there were many witnesses now who have stated that non-human entities were recovered from these crashes, the Air Force has since repeatedly denied these were extraterrestrial craft. And their you think, explanation about what occurred has changed over the years. The Roswell you think... Uh, with the recent admissions, they would have mentioned Roswell uh, at this point. Like, who cares? So, incidents have been verified by hundreds of witnesses, and we have the testimony of one here now. Uh, this is Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., uh, a retired colonel. He's deceased now but he served as both a medical officer and a helicopter pilot during the Iraqi war. And I'll just play his testimony. And this was uh, uh, given uh, during a 2013 citizens hearing on disclosure, which Mr. Stephen Bassett, I think he's here, uh, organized and uh, certainly deserves a lot of credit for, for that. Uh, My so. story for the Roswell part began in the wee hours in the morning of July 1947 when I was awakened by my dad who was returning from an assignment to collect debris of unknown origin from a ranch out of Roswell. This is the Foster Ranch and this is the debris that uh, Mac Brazel. I think everybody agrees there was debris. Apparently the rancher by the name of Mac Brazel notified the local sheriff of Chavez County of the downing of some sort of aircraft on his land. He was not quite sure what the nature of this was uh, he'd seen weather balloons, you know, go down there before, so he was not sure it was that either, but it was something very different. Uh, the sheriff in Chavez County contacted uh, Colonel Blanchard, who is a commander of the Air Force Base in Roswell. Now, Colonel Blanchard uh, knew my dad was the intelligence officer, so he dispatched my dad and a CIC agent, uh, Sheridan Cavill, to investigate what this was, whether it was one of our planes or just whatever, just an unknown crash site. So uh, it was their job to go ahead and ascertain what was out there and bring representative portions of this back to the base so they could study it to uh, determine, make a final determination of this. Uh, as it turns out, uh, our house happened to be on the way to the base. And this is in the wee hours of the morning. So my dad, knowing that he had seen something very special, uh, wanted my mother and myself to look at this also because, uh, as he said, you'll never see this again. Uh, so what he did, he stopped off at the house, awakened my mother and myself, and uh, again, the wee hours in the morning. It was summertime. I've been playing all day with bicycles and things like that. Uh, I was 11 years old at the time, however. And uh, he brought us into the kitchen and saw a smattering of this uh, strange debris on the kitchen floor that he had pre-positioned. Uh, he said, look at this. I think this is what you call a flying saucer or remains thereof. Uh, I was not quite sure what a flying saucer was at that time because I was more interested in bicycling and, you know, using my 22 rifle for practice. Um, but at any rate, uh, he, the first thing he wanted us to do, or me particularly, was to check the debris out make sure there was no electronic components there, looking for vacuum tubes, resistors, uh, uh, condensers, and things like that. Uh, but there wasn't any. Uh, there's, and he already knew that, but he wanted me to satisfy my own curiosity as is. Uh, the debris itself consisted of three components, three types. Uh, there was a, a foil, a very tough metallic foil of some nature that I can't really describe. I have to add that I did not see the uh, bending and unbending of it. Uh, 
uh, but my dad witnessed it. He said it would, uh, if you fold it over, it would unfold and assume its original form. Uh, in addition, there was uh, a black plastic debris, like a broken phonograph record. But the strangest thing I saw was, uh, as being passed around right now, was that this is a replica of one of the eye beams or the beams I saw in the wreckage. Uh, in that, you'll note there's some symbols written along the inside surface of this, and uh, they're a purplish violet hue, semi-reflective of light. Uh, and but this is basically what this was. Uh, is this a replica? Or yes, sir. This is a replica. replica. Okay. If it was original, I wouldn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you never know. I was, that's, yeah, that's right. So, uh, uh, but anyway, my dad uh, uh, drove the debris into the base that night. I think it was that night, maybe early next morning, where he was uh, assigned by Doctor or Colonel Blanchard to uh, fly the material to General Ramey's office in Fort Worth. This was flown in the belly of a B twenty nine under armed guard. So, uh, my dad uh, next. I, this is a picture of my dad taken in General Ramey's office, holding what was obviously a radar target. They had already switched the debris. And the look on his face is quite telling. He says, you got to be kidding me. This is not what I saw, and this is not what I saw either. But at any rate, that's where the cover began in General Ramey's office. So uh, when my dad got home, yeah. he sat my mother and myself down and said in no uncertain terms, you will never talk about this. This is a non-event. And uh, yes, sir, I was an army brat, so I was following order. So I never discussed this with my friends or anybody else until after Stan Friedman interviewed my dad in 1978. Yeah. In 1994, Congressman Stephen Schiff asked GAO, Government Accounting Office, for information about Roswell. Uh, <clears throat> the GAO wrote him back about an, a year later, actually, uh, and, uh, re and stated, uh, outgoing messages related to Roswell were destroyed without authority. However, there was one teletype uh, from uh, one FBI office to another uh, that the GAO did uh, include in their report. And I'll just read from parts of that teletype. Uh, it says, 8th Air Force telephonically advised this office that an object purporting to be a flying disc was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico, resembles a high altitude weather balloon, but that conversation between their office and Wright Field had not borne this out, uh, this, out this belief. Disc and balloon being transported to Wright Field by special plane for examination. So Wright Field uh, became the home of uh, Air Technical Intelligence Service, we called ATIC, uh, and they're the ones that uh, essentially received the uh, re results. Of the this isn't briefing. the most convincing stuff in the world, but you'd have so, to know. Uh, uh, let me pause this just to say. So based on my research, again, I go with the interdimensional uh, hypothesis for ufos so if they make something physical and there's some physical remnants that's fine but i'm not i'm not seeing anything here i'm here for the nuclear weapon stuff but uh we'll uh we'll plow through for the uh, uh let them keep going on september the 23rd of 1947 the chief of the uh, Technical Intelligence Division at Wright Field, essentially ATIC, uh, General Nathan Twining sent a letter to the commanding general of Air Force Intelligence stating that after a preliminary study of UFO reports, the phenomenon is real and not yes. visionary or fictitious. Yes. Now, the question Agreed. I have is how could they have come to that conclusion? I witnessed testimony months of the Roswell incident, unless they had received the debris. And no, 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 no. So I would disagree with the author here. There's more, I mean, they just had a UFO report prior to, um, prior to Roswell that they talked about UFOs have been with us for a long time. And I'm sure they were seeing, ufos way before roswell um there's uh 
in during World War II, they would call them Foo Fighters. So him going, thinking, this is very Roswell-centric, which is kind of weird. Wasn't really expecting this. So I would, uh, um, they would get a lot of reports. I, I, I've heard, and I think it was from Jack Filet, uh, again, his uh, Joe Rogan interview, maybe it was December of last year, was that they wanted to put the kibosh on UFO stuff because they were getting, the U.S. Air Force was getting so many calls. They wanted to leave it open for actual threats. Um, and they didn't want to just have people call like I saw a UFO. And granted, a lot of UFOs are, you saw Venus or something like that. But even for legitimate UFOs, they didn't want them clogging up the, the communication system in case there was a Russian bomber or something they actually had to worry about. Uh, analyzed it. So, uh, and then I'll jump to, let's see, current day. Uh, this is from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, preliminary assessment of the unidentified aerial phenomenon, June 25th, 2021. And the executive summary says, most of the UAP reported probably do represent physical objects. Uh, this is a pretty startling admission by the Department of Defense. Uh, I certainly have never seen anything like this before, uh, but essentially they're agreeing what, with that previous letter from September of 1947. This is real, not visionary. It's not swamp gas. Um, and so... Uh, um, well, just because it's real doesn't mean it's physical or in the paranormal area, which UFOs in my opinion, do fall under is that there can be physical effects in the real world. So you, you get, um, you get data, which is real, this sh or shows that they're physical and data, which shows that they're not physical. Like they don't make sounds. They don't make sonic booms. Uh, let me just, uh, from Paul, what does the guy know with inside knowledge on what I believe happened? Um, I don't know if I know anyone with actual inside knowledge. Maybe this was from uh, Hugh Ross's book, but the um, um, at least some people speculate that Japan would send balloons uh, during World War II uh, with the intention of them landing in America and causing fires and stuff like that. So they think it might be some of that. So, all right, let's continue. Where do we go from here? Uh, I'll jump now to uh, 1948 to 1950. This is a letter uh, from Air Force Headquarters, the Director of Air Force Office of Special Investigation, Summary of Observation of Aerial Phenomena in New Mexico. Uh, and I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. It says, uh, it was determined that the frequency of unexplained aerial phenomenon in the New Mexico area was such that uh, an organized plan of reporting these observations should be undertaken. Um, the next statement, uh, the observers of these phenomena include scientists, special agents of the Office of Special Investigations, USAF, uh, airline pilots, Los Alamos security inspectors, military personnel, and many other persons whose reliability is not questioned. The phenomenon have continued occur uh, have continuously occurred in the New Mexico skies during the past 18 months, and uh, these phenomena are occurring in the vicinity of sensitive military and government installations. Oh, uh, okay. So there has been that correlation before in the UFO community, I at least pick this up from John Keel. They call these flaps where there's un, either in certain areas during certain time frames, uh, you get a lot of uh, sightings. So that was a letter uh, uh, written in the um, late 40s. I'm sorry, early 50s. Um, in fact, the U uh, US Air Force 
did have a reporting uh, regulation in 1959. This is AFR 200-2. It's seven pages of regulation on UFO reporting requirements and response. Great, I'm sorry I have to do this. I need to take a little uh, break. I need to get some water. I'm sorry for doing this only a half hour in, but I will edit this out later. Everybody hang on, I'll be back in a minute. Sorry about that. Some I suddenly started not to feel that great. Um, so I will edit that out later. If I start not feeling well again, I will uh, cut this short and just uh, pick up uh, from where I left off. So uh, that's the problem with doing stuff live, I guess. Responsibilities by Air Force personnel. It defines what is meant by a UFO. Um, and it defines what the Air Force interest is in UFOs as a possible threat uh, to determine uh, technology or scientific data and, and anything to explain the phenomenon. So that was the purpose of these reporting requirements so that more Air Force personnel would report and the proper way to do that. Uh, uh, this regulation was um, eventually withdrawn, but it did exist in 1959. Uh, now we'll jump to um, early 1960s, and this is the testimony of, of uh, Jerome Nelson, former Air Force First Lieutenant. Um, while he was uh, an Atlas missile crew commander, uh, at Walker Air Force Base, which is formerly Roswell, in 1964. On six different occasions, maintenance crews reported UFOs overhead and again, directing a beam of light on the missile. Uh, so Lieutenant Jameson uh, is still living, by the way. Uh, and so uh, he was anxious to uh, again, repeat this story for you. 
And now we're going to uh, go by remote connection. I uh, hope uh, to, uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Jacobs. Robert Jacobs. Robert Jacobs. Uh, Again, that echoes, not me. The Professor Emeritus of Communication at Bradley University. He retired after teaching at several universities over the span of 40 years. In 1964, he was the officer in charge of a photo optical instrumentation uh, group uh, uh, squadron at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. One of his duties was to provide photo photographic documentation of missile test launches. So I think uh, we'll turn it over to you, over to you, over to you, over to you, over to you. I can hear you just fine, Bob, and uh, welcome to the Ozark Mountains where I live right now. Can you, can you hear me back there? Just give me a nod. All right. Can you, you hear me? All right, let's skip over been this. Up there? So well, I want you to go up there and there's a forest. All right, uh, let's go back. 63, 64. Um, many of the missiles blew up on the pad. And the engineers at Boeing and Douglas and other outfits who were building these, these missiles needed to know what was happening, uh, what took place frame by frame, second by second, in fact, millisecond by millisecond. We'd have uh, about 30 cameras set up on every single launch. We'd have three tracking sites to provide the triangulation for the things. And one day I got a call from my uh, major Florence J. Mansman who was the optical instrumentation officer at First Strategic Air Base uh, Air Command. He called me into his office and said, Bob, have you ever been up to Big Sur? And I said, well, when I, my college days, I was a beatnik. And I remembered uh, Lawrence Furlingetti uh, speaking his poems at the Lepenthe, Lepenthe Cafe in Big Sur. So yeah, I've been up there. I said, well, why don't you go up there? And there's a forest. Uh, a service station on Anderson Peak. I want you to go up there and just take a look around and see if it's possible for us to get a line of sight from Big Sur back down to Vandenberg. I said, okay. I hopped in my uh, station wagon and drove up to Big Sur. I met the Forest Service officer there and he took me up to the Forest Service Road, which you can see here. And we found a place where uh, a prearranged time a missile was launched and I managed to look down the, down the coast about 160 miles and yes we could see this thing from from the side. The point was that the engineer wanted to see what was going on from the side view of these missiles. From our positions on Vandenberg all we could do is look up the tailpipe. So we took a tracking, a tracking mount up there and photographed with our little uh, cameras uh, a couple of launches and sure enough the engineers were excited to see the the uh, side view. Next thing that happened is after I'd established this site, Major Mansman called me and said, I want you to go back up to the site. We're sending something up for you. So I drove back up to Vandenberg, uh, to a Big Sur, and suddenly um, this huge truck came pulling up the Forest Service Road. It was towing a, a massive telescope, a catadroptic telescope with a potential focal length of 2,400 inches. I'm sure you photographers in the crowd will know that uh, 25 millimeters for a 60 millimeter camera is, uh, or a one inch lens is normal. Imagine a 2,000 uh, uh, inch telescope. That's it that you're seeing on the screen right now. We set this telescope up and did a couple of tests with it. And then something magical happened, something that changed my view of the universe and our position in it. On September 14th, 1964, there was a launch of an Atlas D missile from Vandenberg. And this group that you see here in front, I'm the guy wearing the MG jacket. We were told to wear civilian clothes up there so we didn't get the natives riled up. Uh, there was an early morning fog bank as we looked down the coast toward Vandenberg. Suddenly this missile popped out and flew down range beautifully against the, the, the clear sky. Uh, we couldn't see what the telescope was seeing. So I need to explain to you why we missed it on the site. So this telescope had a, an image orthokine tube, which was attached to the telescope. So the signal went from the telescope into the image orthokine tube, and a 35 millimeter Mitchell camera was established shooting the picture of the surface of the image orthokine tube. 
it was called kinescope recording. For those of you old enough to remember kinescope recording from uh, the old days of TV. So it was covered with a black shield and we couldn't see what, what was in there. Anyhow, we watched this missile go until it went out of our sight with the 2000 inch telescope, which at that point had about a focal length of a thousand inches. Locked down on it, we were radar tracking it. Locked down on what was in, we couldn't see what was, what was in it. Um, but we were all celebrating, jumping up and down, saying, yeah, we got it. The engineers are going to be so happy. And um, uh, the, the, the folks from, uh, from BU who brought the telescope out to us were happy. And everything settled down. I went back to, to Vandenberg. Two days later, I was called by Major Mansman. He said, uh, Lieutenant Jacobs, uh, I want you to come to my office right away. The major tells you to do something, and you're a lieutenant, you do it. So I hustled over to, to First Strategic Care uh, headquarters. I walked into Major Mansman's office, and I'll describe for you what I saw. There was a table set up in his office, and on the table was a 16 millimeter, millimeter projector. There was a daylight screen on the wall uh, uh, adjacent to it. There were two guys, two men in gray flannel suits. There was Major Man Mansman and his office over, over here, and here was the screen. Major Manson said, Lieutenant, sit down. And I did. He said, now watch this. He turned the projector on, and the most amazing thing happened. We could see the three, uh, uh, the bottom three stages of that rocket filling the frame from 160 miles away. It was amazing. Uh, the clarity was beautiful, and that thing took off, and we watched it go through all three stages of powered flight, stage one, stage two, stage three. And then we saw, incredibly, at a long, long distance, the thing was now heading for Kwajalein. And the nose cone opened up, and radar chaff, essentially aluminum foil, spread out in front of it. Here's what, what the function of the aluminum foil was. We were testing uh, to see if we could launch a, a nuclear warhead into an orbit slightly above the nuclear chaff so that the Russians would aim their anti-missile missiles at the chaff and our little warhead would go spoop like this and fly over and obliterate Moscow. That's the game we were playing. It was horrifying to think about in, in retrospect. Anyhow, as the thing was flying along, we saw the, the warhead uh, eject in over the chaff and it was flying along we're going about 8,000 miles an hour now. And suddenly, from in the frame, we saw an object come in from the same way we, we were going, 8,000 miles. This object flew in. Um, I'm trying to do something here on the screen so you can see. The object flew in. It, it came up to our warhead. It went around the top of the warhead, fired a beam of light down onto the top of the warhead. Went around to the front of the warhead. Man, we're all traveling at about 8,000 miles an hour here. Fired another beam of light. Went down below the warhead. Fired another beam of light. Went around the way it had come in. Fired another beam of light. And then flew out of the frame the same way it had come in. At that point, the warhead tumbled out of space. We were, we had, let me, let me tell you what happened next. This is just the same thing. The lights came on, Major Manson looked at me, the two guys in gray suits looked at me, and Major Manson said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. He said, then what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. Major Manson said, you are never to say that again. As far as you're concerned, this didn't happen. He said, you understand? I said, yes, sir. He escorted me to his door, of his office and he said no i mean i appreciate this testimony um one of the things we should mention is we it's kind of hard to speculate why so if we go with the interdimensional hypothesis uh, you know so i would say most of these i believe are demons um you don't know for sure for all of them but say they're some sort of spiritual entity why would they be doing this i have no idea i'm going to just be honest um but you do see a pattern of deception over time which i go over in my how we know ufos aren't aliens video where the 
the speed and how the UFOs appear over time kind of change and stay a, a little bit ahead of our technology. So going, and if they're going over 8,000 miles per hour, I'm kind of curious if the UFO made any um, sonic booms or any, anything like that. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. I don't need to remind you of the seriousness of our security breach, do I? I said, no, sir. He said, all right, then you're dismissed. But as I left, so I was very late, he leaned over to speak into my ear to say something that the guys from in the suits couldn't see. He said, Lieutenant, if you were ever tortured in the future, if somebody has you up against the wall and they're frying your privates with fire, he said, you can tell them this just to get out of it. This time, oh, it was laser tracking. We didn't have laser tracking in 1964. For 17 years, I shut up. I never said anything to anybody. And then one night, I was doing a late night talk show in, in Eureka, California, on station KFMI. And the topic of UFOs came up. And I had, I had been muddling with this thing in, in my mind because here's what happens, folks. You see something that you've, that, that's totally inexplicable. On the heck to this thing, and it was, by the way, a flying saucer. It was shaped like a saucer, like a ping pong ball on top, and it was firing a beam of light at our warheads. How could such a thing happen? How could a guy from Compton, California, who'd gone to USC and played a little football and, and worked for Walt Disney and so on, suddenly have his world shaken up by discovering that we are not alone? That, that thing was up there, that I saw it, it was on film. And it sounds like he's assuming they're extraterrestrial aliens, which I would not do. Wait, I'm still alive, barely. When it happened to me, my world changed, my worldview changed, but I was under orders to shut up, so I shut up. Part of UFO, uh, U.S. Air Force cover-up, in fact. Finally, <clears throat> I told my story on my late-night radio show one night, and... All kinds of <clears throat> strange things happened. I started getting calls from people I didn't know uh, saying that, oh, I had a UFO experience too, and so on and so forth. Let's cut ahead a little ways to, I got a job teaching college at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. And I'm sure you, you, you folks in the press must know that we who teach college don't make a lot of money. And I was on a, a nine month contract. So in the summer, I decided I needed to make a couple of bucks to pay my rent and so forth. And so I thought, what can I do? And I thought, that UFO incident, how could I could sell this to somebody because UFOs were, were a topic of concern at the moment. So I wrote an article about my experience and I shopped it around. It went to Omni Magazine, it went to Time, I shopped it around and no, no one was interested. So where would you go to sell a UFO story? I call the National Enquirer. And yes, they bought the story. And of course, they took my story and put it in the, their, their ridiculous writing style. His law, jaw dropped. He fell over. Oh, good grief. One of those things that, that those of us who I used to teach journalism would go, oh my gosh. But I got paid. And then to put it mildly, the fit hit, just, hit the jam. Suddenly my world did change. I started getting telephone calls late at night at my home. I'm not gonna say the words because I don't wanna be censored here, but a voice would say, uh, it always ended up with, you're going down MF. You can interpret what MF means. They would leave this message on my, remember answering machines? We used to have those. Well, they would leave the message on my answering machine. They John Keel mentions uh, all sorts of weird stuff. He would get phone calls he would get poltergeists while investigating UFOs. He would get um, friends were encountering poltergeist activity. This was uh, detailed in his book, uh, Operation Trojan Horse. So obviously you can get phone calls from people who want to intimidate you or something from real flesh and blood, like DOD people. But there could be phone calls um uh let's say from a paranormal source that's uh what john keel would relate they were they were they were, they were not they were they were fearless one night my wife and i came home from a movie and 
The phone rang and I picked it up and the voice said, fireworks in your mailbox at night. Oh, what a beautiful sight. You're going down, MF. And there was a boom. My wife and I went to the, to the door. We lived in, in the country and we had a rural, mail, rural, rural mailbox. It was on fire. They had blown up my mailbox while I was talking to them on the phone. You're going down, MF. I put up with that for a couple of weeks, and then I, I had a friend named John uh, uh, Andrews who worked for the Chester Corporation. He was a UFO researcher, and he said, what you have to do right now, Bob, is go public more and more. So he set me up to write an article for the MUFON Journal, the Mutual UFO Network Journal, and I did this in, in uh, journalistic prose, and the, the immediate threats to me stopped. Um, having been part of a cover-up for so long, and then having been threatened, I literally had my, my life threatened, I later lost a job at teaching college because a guy named Phil Class, who was a paid informant of the CIA, we're told, uh, wrote a letter to, to my supervisor there at the University of Maine saying uh, that I was making up tall tales of the journalism professor and how could how could a university allow me to continue doing that and blah blah blah. Maybe this guy was DOD stuff. And obviously they probably wouldn't want the secrets out. Not I don't know if they cared about the D, the UFO stuff, but the especially the technical aspects of the nuclear missiles. And I was fired. This cover up has been going on for a long, long time. And those of us who are here today in front of me, Bob Salas, who was a, a captain in the Air Force, who was actually one of those heroes who sat down in a, in a silo um, with, a, with a key and a, and a partner ready to go into Armageddon if he was ordered to do so. You can't imagine the pressure this man's been under. And what we're here today to tell you is that this is real, that you folks in the press need to get to it, and tell the story and tell it correctly and never mind spin never mind politics this has nothing whatever to do with politics doesn't matter who's president or who's chief executive of any corporation this is a real event it is the most important event in the history of mankind we are not alone he's going with the alien interpretation uh -huh. again dr jacob I'm, I'm going to quickly play uh, an animation that was put together again. You know, what would be more earth-shattering if, for people, if they recognize UFOs as coming from an extraterrestrial source or from an interdimensional source? Now... A couple hundred years ago, 200, 300 years ago, recognizing UFOs being some sort of spiritual entity or caused by some sort of spiritual entity probably wouldn't have been, would have been shocking, but wouldn't have been that earth shattering. But as materialism takes hold and hold over and over, we're going to get more of the extraterrestrial hypothesis because that fits into our priors but I, I, um again as my main ufo video uh shows it doesn't fit the evidence all the evidence that well so there's assumption uh among the press and among other people like if 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 you say ufo you mean extraterrestrial aliens uh Robert Hastings had a lot to do with this one too. So let me just play that. The nose cones separate. The chaff flew out in front of. We saw this as obviously reflections of light rippling like that. And then we saw the dummy warhead flying along. That's going between six and eight thousand miles an hour at that point. And it's on the, the, the fringe of space. And suddenly into that, that frame. An object flew in, chasing the chaff, the word, and so on, at the same speed. And in polar orbit, it fired a beam of light at the warhead. The, the beam of light struck that. The object flew up, shot another beam of light at the dummy warhead, went around like this, shot another beam of light at it, went down, shot a beam of light, and then flew out the same way it had come in. At which time, the dummy warhead fell out of the frame. 
Uh, 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 and then we got uh, the statement of, um, excuse me, Major Mansman. I didn't look for this. The Northman suffered. So Major Mansman responded to, um, I think this was a journalist that wanted more information about this incident. And uh, Major Mansman did support Dr. Jacobs in these letters. And uh, I'll just read a little bit here. We knew the missile nose cone size, but could not compare since I uh, did not know how far from the, the missile the object was from the missile at the time of the beam release. The shape was classic disc. The center seemed to be raised, bubble. Not sure any ports or slits could be seen. Uh, was stationary or moving slightly, floating over the entire lower saucer shape, which was glowing and seemed to be rotating slowly at the point of beam release. Okay, uh, Dr. Jacobs, any final words? Final words? Uh, no. I, I can tell a couple of tales about the, the, the further uh, cover-up. Let me just talk, because it's kind of funny. One of the researchers who, con researchers who contacted me was uh, uh, Lee Graham, uh, who worked for one of the, the missile, one of the missile manufacturing companies in Los Angeles. Lee was quite interested in UFOs. He pursued the, the things throughout his lifetime. So he contacted me, and, and I told him my story, and then he went to verify what I had told him. He contacted the the Air Force to inquire about Lieutenant Robert M. Jacobs. They told him there was no such Lieutenant Robert M. Jacobs, nor had there ever been. He went to Vandenberg. He said, that, um, he, he asked them if there had been a Lieutenant Robert M. Jacobs as officer in charge of optical instrumentation in the 1369th Photo Squadron. He was told no such officer ever existed. He pursued his, his research. He wondered if there had been a missile launch on September 14th, 1964. He was told there was no such missile launch ever, ever, ever taking place. We continued his investigation and finally the Air Force had to admit that, well, yes, there had been a Lieutenant Robert M. Jacobs and yes, he was officer in charge of photo optical instrumentation at Vandenberg and yes, there was a missile launch on the date uh, in question. When we filed a form of uh, now, I think understandably he thinks this cover up was UFOs and yeah, maybe they did want to cover up UFO stuff. But I think, you know, just I worked at a defense contractor for a number of years. I I really don't think they want would want the public to know in the height of the Cold War that UFOs are messing with uh or interested in nuclear weapons tests that would not go over well so yeah i mean i think they have a uh the government would have a legitimate reason to cover up that story so maybe he could cut the government some slack here a, a freedom of information act request to get a copy of the film he was told no such film existed and let me verify that it probably doesn't because there, there, there's been some controversy over whether I'm telling the truth, whether Major Mansman is telling the truth, and I assure you that we are, he did. He has passed on, uh, unfortunately. And what we know is that the two guys in gray suits who were in Major Mansman's office that day were was one of the government agencies that are all alphabetized. We believe it was the CIA. They took the reel of film from Major Mansman. They took, they reeled it down and they cut off, snipped off the bit of the film that had the encounter on it. They gave Major Mansman back the rest of the film and they said to him, we don't need to remind you of a security breach, do we? He said, no, sir. And they walked out of his office with the film in hand. Major Mansman reported how many people had seen the film. And here's who we reported saw, saw it. He saw it. The commanding officer saw it. The chief scientist saw it. I saw it. And one other person saw it. Those are the only people who saw this film. There was a, a, a man named uh, Kingston George who was involved in, in, in the thing as an engineer with, with one of the missile companies. He did not see the same film that Major Mansman and I saw. That bit of film went off to 
God knows where, wherever the CIA does stuff, uh, and no one has ever seen it since. I've had a couple of so-called investigators who said, oh, I got your film, I found your film, and they showed me the film, and I uh, no, that's not the film. That's it, Bob. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to Back move to on, sir. Uh, no, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to next introduce uh, David Schindele, served in active duty Air Force from 1963 to 68. He was a missile launch officer on the Atlas ICBM at Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington, until June of 65. He later served as a missile launch officer at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, until 1968. After leaving active duty, he worked as a project manager at Hamilton Standard in the development of the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. He also participated in the development of the Apollo astronaut backpacks used on the moon expeditions. He worked as a computer systems analyst until his retirement in 2004. Uh, Mr. Schindler. Mr. Schindler. He probably stops paying attention on Zoom calls like me. Oh, there he is. Uh, yes, that is me. More than 50 years ago. <laughs> Good morning. My name is David Schindler. I'm a retired Air Force captain, and I'm very proud to have served my country. The report released by the Office of Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, on June 25th this year stated the following. UAP, or UFOs, may pose a challenge to U.S. national security. Coming from an important agency of the U.S. government, this statement is very important and very significant. ODNI is... Well, it says if they are foreign adversary collection platforms or provide evidence of potential adversary has developed either a breakthrough or disruptive technology, which no, I don't think anyone really goes for that. Is the first government agency to ever publicly suggest that national security might be challenged or threatened by unidentified aerial phenomena or by what the public has always referred to as UFOs are real objects, which is now inclusive to the government term of aerial phenomena. This summary paragraph from the ODNI report reflects the essence of the report content. Let me point out that it notes that safety concerns primarily center on aviators contending with increasingly cluttered air domain and that there is a national security challenge if they are foreign adversary collection platforms. Let me be very clear. The ODNI report did not effectively address the substance of UAP UFO concerns as specifically directed and requested. The request by the Senate Intelligence Committee to ODNI was to, quote, submit an intelligence assessment of the threat posed by unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs, and the progress the Department of Defense Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force has made in understanding this threat. The ODNI report I just wanted to say, if you don't have the right categories, you really the only categories i see a lot of people have is either this is extraterrestrial aliens or this is just some sort of fake phenomenon that science can explain blah blah blah, blah. and um if if you don't have the categories that religious people have then I don't think you'll be able to interpret the data because you won't be able to make sense of this. So I don't, I, I'm kind of curious how many people with inside the Department of Defense uh, can uh, 
can do something with this or how many actually uh, try to figure out the uh, interdimensional stuff. Provided no indication that historical data will be accessed, which resides deep inside some intelligence agencies, including the CIA and those agencies that ODNI gave its report to. ODNI even admitted, quote, the data set described in this report is currently limited primarily to US government reporting of incidents occurring from November 2004 to March 2021. There has been a long history of UFO incidents and encounters with much investigation of them from 1947 and even earlier. Yes, even earlier. The U.S. Air Force began its official investigations in 1948. Even earlier than that. Sign. Then Project Grudge in 1949. Then Project Blue Book in 1952. Until the Air Force took their investigations. Are they ever going to make the uh, mystery airships of the late 1800s? That, to me, definitely shows they're not aliens. Uh, I'll try to, maybe I'll try to post uh, the video link in the description while, while this is going on. Underground in 1969. For over 20 years, the Air Force was concerned with encounters by the military with great reason. There is a great deal of evidence from the past consisting of witness testimony and documentation, which indicates that for many decades, the military has been harassed by UFOs. The objects have shown capabilities far beyond what science, physics, and the technology of today can explain. And they seem to be controlled by highly sophisticated intelligence. They have demonstrated a maneuverability in flight that no human pilot could possibly endure. Now I'm about to inform you of one of those prior UFO incidents that did indeed impact national security. Now, uh, stuff a pilot couldn't endure, that would kind of lend itself to the interdimensional hypothesis. I'm just pointing out that out there. It was an incident that I was involved with where I had to deal with its ramifications. In September of 1966, I was a Minuteman ICBM launch control officer and deputy commander of a launch crew stationed at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. I was involved in a UFO incident at that time where a flying object tampered with and took down a total of 10 nuclear-tipped ICBM missiles by rendering them unlaunchable. It all began for me early one morning when having breakfast and listening to a television newscast. That's pretty on interesting. TV station in the town of Minot. The newscaster announced that residents of Mohall, North Dakota, saw strange lights west of town that night, which they attributed to a UFO. This caught my attention because I was scheduled to relieve, replace the current Minuteman launch crew at November Flight Launch Control Center which is three miles west of that town. When I attended the pre-departure crew briefing on base that morning, where 15 two-man officer crews would meet each morning prior to going to their assigned launch control centers, we were told that a few missiles at November flight had gone off alert, but nothing more was said on this. After the briefing, several missile crews came up to me and mentioned about what they heard on the news that morning and my crew commander also acknowledged he heard the news. When my crew commander and I arrived at November Flight Launch Control Facility, which was a drab green nondescript building surrounded by a high fence and located 37 miles from base, my commander entered through the front door of the building to debrief security guards. Upon entering the rear door of the building, I was met by the site manager, who was a tech sergeant, and he asked if I heard what happened overnight. I responded by stating I knew that residents of Mohall reported sighting strange lights during the night. He then took me to the day room and its west-facing windows 
and he described to me what he and others had seen that night. He described a large object just outside the perimeter fence with bright flashing lights, but without noise. And it hovered close to the ground. Without noise, hovering. Again, this is classic UFO stuff. No noise leads us to believe it's not really physical. I estimated the object to be 80 to 100 feet wide based on how he gestured its sides with his outstretched arms. Probably no visible means of propulsion. After many minutes passed, the object then glided to the north end of the building and out of sight. But it then became visible to security guards in the control section of the building. The object, which hovered just outside the main gate, was slightly blocked from view because of the large garage located inside the fence to the right. With security and other personnel viewing the object through security control windows, and with security personnel preferring to remain in the building, it was just a short period of time before the object abruptly took flight and it disappeared within a second. There were eight people topside within the building who saw this object. And it included six security personnel, a facility cook, and a site manager. They all confirmed it was a terrifying experience to behold, which I could tell by the tone in their voices and expressions on their faces. They knew the object was not a helicopter, and base choppers normally did not fly at night, especially without notice to the facility. My commander and I then entered the elevator next to the security center, which lowered us 60 feet below ground to where their hardened launch control center capsule was located. When we arrived, the blast door was to the capsules open for us and we walked in. We were greeted by the two officers of the launch crew who were waiting for us, but we also immediately glanced at the launch control console located at the opposite end of the room, which displayed the status of the 10 nuclear tip missiles. With the missiles positioned in hardened underground secure silos located many miles away in all directions from us, the lights on the console indicated they were all off alert and unlaunchable. Beyond uh, UFOs uh, interacting with machines, cars, stuff like that, turning them off, uh, planes stalling out in the presence of UFOs. This is all very common. Uh, some sort of electromagnetical radiation sort of phenomenon. So this is common in UFO reports. And they're just, you probably, uh, civilian UFO reports, obviously they don't want the, I, I'd be really curious if the Soviet Union and any other nuclear power has uh, stories from their side uh, on this. The duty crew told us that the missiles went down when the flying object was hovering next to the main gate and above the underground capsule. The crew was communicating with the head security guard topside during the entire time of the incident. The crew discussed this situation extensively with my commander and I, and then we all went through the formalities of crew changeover. When the crew left, we closed the blast door behind them, and then my commander and I settled in to monitor our 10 inoperable nuclear-tipped ICBM missiles. All the missiles indicated guidance and control system malfunction. At other times during crew changeover at launch centers, we might note one or two missiles down for scheduled maintenance, but never had we seen a situation like this. It was all new to us. And it was so very disturbing and troubling to us when attempting to comprehend the reality of the situation that had come our way. But we also had a forewarning, and that was followed by the emotions exhibited by Airman Topside and by the officer crew below ground briefing us on actions they took during the incident. The next morning, after we were relieved by another crew, we arrived topside. I attempted to further question the head security guard about the incident and on what he saw. But he interrupted me 
and said he was instructed not to talk to anyone about it. And then my commander turned toward me and said he had received a call overnight from the Office of Special Investigations, the OSI, while I was on a rest break below ground. Now, I don't know if he's going to go the conspiracy route as well, but really, honestly, do you really want the Soviets to know that your nuclear weapons can't work because of UFOs? I'm hoping the same thing happens on the Soviet side, but this is a legitimate cover-up. This is a legitimate national security uh, secret. My commander was told by the OSI that we were to forever keep our lips zipped about the incident. And he was told that as far as you're concerned, it never happened. We were even instructed to never talk to each other again about the incident. In effect, the Air Force confirmed to me the seriousness and reality of the UFO incident. Ironically, this was verified by the fact that my crew commander and I were never questioned never interrogated, never debriefed on the incident, and neither was the other crew. It amazed us that we were not questioned. Instead, we were only told in no uncertain terms to keep quiet. We were never told what the security classification of the incident was. We were never instructed or trained on what to do if another incident should ever happen again. and other missile crews were never informed of our incident or of the other UFO incidents in the missile field at the time. We missileers all possess top secret clearances and we are under constant review and training to ensure that our technical skills and ability to follow complex procedures with high stringent requirements. We are all well-educated, psychologically profiled, and responsible for, new, for our nuclear security and operational readiness and maintaining our nation's primary line of defense. It was a serious game of nuclear deterrence, and we were trusted to launch our missiles upon receipt of a verified and authenticated order. We knew it involved the preservation of freedom and liberty for the American people, and we knew an attacking aggressor would think twice when facing us in a tense Cold War situation. We are proud to serve our country in that way. Many airmen involved with the- I think the PowerPoint person is getting way ahead of the speaker. This incident have passed away, including my crew commander. But the commander of the crew that my commander, but the commander of the crew that my commander and I relieved, he is still around. After suggesting many times to him that he come forward as I have, he said, you need to understand that after I returned to base after the incident, I was ordered to sign a document stating I would forever remain silent. His trepidation about that and his personal integrity keeps him silent to this day, 55 years later. We are all proud of our integrity and the Air Force relied on us because of it. However, the Air Force has not been honest with Congress and the American public. Well, again, there is a legitimate reason for keeping UFO interactions with nuclear weapons secret. UFOs in general, probably not. When the Air Force cl closed Project Blue Book in 1969, after my incident in 1966 and many other incidents, the conclusions of the project were, number one, there was no evidence that sightings categories as unidentified were extraterrestrial vehicles. I agree with that. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong slide here. How do I get back? Well, I guess he was the culprit. Okay. 
I'm, unfortunately, I'm reading the script here, but okay. When the Air Force cl closed Bro Project Blue Book in 1969, after my incident, the number one conclusion was there is no evidence that sightings categorized as unidentified were extra extraterrestrial vehicles. And number two, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force gave an indication of a threat to our national security. The U.S. Air Force currently states on its website that since the termination of Project Blue Book, nothing has occurred that would support a resumption of UFO investigations by the Air Force. That UFOs do not right here. The Air Force continues with this proclamation that UFOs do not exist or put pros a threat to national security. I was held hostage to both those lies for about 40 years. And it is past time for the truth to come out and be revealed. Congress and the intelligence community have a responsibility here. And others must be released from the burden of holding back the truth. Um, you know, unless you're giving away nuclear weapons. February secrets. 20th, 1960. An article in the New York Times featured Roscoe H. Hillencotter, who was installed as the first director of the CIA on September 18, 1947. Prior to becoming the CIA director, Hillencotter was director of the U.S. Central Intelligence Group, which was during the time of the famous Roswell incident in July of 1947. The article in the Times began as follows. The Air Force has sent its commands a warning to treat sightings of unidentified flying objects as serious business, directly related to the nation's defense. In other words, national security. But you'll note that there was no notice to Project Blue Book, Congress, or the public on this by the Air Force. And then that article quoted Hill and Cotter with the following. It is time for the truth to be brought out in open congressional hearings. This was in 1960. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official security, secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flight objects are nonsense. To hide the facts, the Air Force has silenced its personnel. That is true. And a lot of people don't come, or at least a lot of people used to not come forward because they didn't want to deal with the ridicule. That is, that is true. We probably lost a lot of number of eyewitness accounts and maybe evidence we can sift through over the years because of that. Just people didn't want to, and people who did come forward later just didn't want to deal with, or didn't want to be interviewed anymore because they, um, they were just being made fun of or they, you know, they just didn't want to be treated like a sideshow freak or something. That was in 1960, but six years after that statement, I was one of those that Hillencotter was referring to as being silenced. His prophecy. That has now changed. I stand here before you today. I respectfully suggest that OD and I take another serious look at this report because I am willing to testify on all of this before a congressional hearing. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening. All right, I'm going to do five second skips here and there. And one thing I leave before I need to do before I leave is introduce our host, Robert Salas. Um, Captain Salas holds several degrees. One in uh, all right. This better not. To, I basic science. I don't want this to turn to an Oscar US speech. And uh, a master science of duty from 1964. Roller. Uh, he was a target target drone pilot. Titan three missile propulsion certification for 22 years. He was also an educator. Salas is very special to me. Um, I wouldn't have come out and start searching the internet and then later in 1990s 
trying to find information on my incident and seeing if there was any documents out there for anybody was talking. Uh, I didn't find anything and I gave up. Uh, in 2001, I found an article on the internet describing Robert Salas's incident. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, it's been verified. The, in the incident that he had was almost identical to the one I had. And I experienced a, just a joyful freedom. And I finally was able to tell my wife my secret. And uh, so thanks, Robert, for helping me out. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, If any uh, of you present uh, are looking for a front page statement, uh, I think this could be it. I remember he's with the press club. UFOs disabled 20 nuclear missiles. Okay, that's definitely worth the headline. Days. If you include uh, Dave Shindelli's incident within six months, uh, UFO shut down 30 nuclear missiles. This, there's no question about this as far as we're concerned. Um, I think the, the testimony is overwhelming. I'm gonna talk uh, just real briefly about the, what the facilities look like. This is the, shows the Oscar flight. That photograph uh, shows the front uh, gate of Oscar flight where I was located during my incident. The one uh, image below it shows the uh, cutaway view of where the capsule is about 60 feet underground. Um, uh, and that's where we were locked in. Uh, I think uh, Dave mentioned the huge, uh, huge door we had there. And then uh, the next one's the launch facility. That's where the missiles are actually located. They're about a mile away. Uh, on average from the launch control center in a, in a kind of a ring around that central point. Um, so what, one of the first witnesses I was able to find uh, for those March incidents was uh, Colonel Walter Fiegel. Colonel Fiegel is still alive and well. I spoke to him uh, fairly recently within months ago uh, and he couldn't be here with us today, but uh, I'm sure he would be more than happy to testify before Congress. And I'll just play um, the conversation that we had um, uh, when we had this conversation. Uh, when I at first looked Just skip him for coming back. after I talked to Colonel Fiegel, um, I gave him the information of Eric Carlson, who was his commander in the uh, capsule at the time. Uh, you see uh, on the, the map on the uh, right-hand side there, you see it's circled where Echo Flight was located, about 100 miles to the east of Great Falls, Montana, uh, near a, a town called Lewiston. Um, and then after a while, I got uh, these letters from uh, Commander Carlson. As far as I know, Commander Carlson is still alive, although I haven't heard from him in quite a while. And uh, in, uh, in these two messages that I received from him, uh, the first one, he confirms what uh, Colonel Fiegel just told us uh, about the echo flight shutdown. 
and also confirm the fact that SAC headquarters sent uh, people out there to interview both of them. So they both had interviews. Uh, one of them, I think Colonel Fiegel told me, was with SYNC-SAC, or Commander-in-Chief of Strategic Air Command at the time. And uh, Carlson also said we had his permission to, uh, to use his name, uh, associate with this, and that uh, UFO sightings were fairly common. One of the first uh, documents we received under the Freedom of Information Act was this document. It confirms the echo flight shutdown and the very grave concern the Strategic Air Command headquarters had because they could not understand how this could happen. All 10 missiles in echo flight at Maelstrom lost strategic alert within 10 seconds of each other. Um, the fact uh, no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern. Yeah, makes goes sense. on to uh, state that we need an immediate investigation and uh, it, and that's when uh, uh, the Boeing got involved. Boeing had the overall um, uh, oversight of the weapon system, the Missile Man, Minuteman 1 uh, missile system, and they organized uh, a large uh, investigative team. The Air Force also had an investigative team, but that was done in secret. Another document we received was this one. This was part of the uh, quarterly report that uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base Wing was supposed to do uh, to send to SAC headquarters on a quarterly basis. And uh, one of the documents we got back says uh, uh, rumors of unidentified objects, UFO, around the area of echo flight at the time of the fault were disproven. So essentially, the Air Force is stating they have proven a negative. Uh, in other words, um, they have proven that something did not happen. <laughs> so I, I don't know how that, that's done, but uh, that's, what, that's what it says here in the official document. We later uh, wrote to uh, Airman David Gamble, who wrote these documents for uh, uh, the, the Malmstrom Missile Wing, and he stated, I don't recall interviews with the mobile strike team or anyone in the radar squadron. What I do recall is there was a general unwillingness to discuss the subject by anyone I can contact it. Uh, there are two times that I recall when sections of the history were scrutinized and changes were made beyond editorial. Uh, these were UFO sightings history, so he confirms that there's, there has been a history at Malmstrom Air Force Base of UFO sightings, and reported morale problem in the fighter interceptor squadron. That's from David Gamble. Uh, one of the things that uh, was suspected could have caused these failures, uh, and again, at Echo Flight and also my incident, Oscar Flight, uh, the... Uh, feedback we got from the system was guidance and control system failure. Uh, we had an inertial guidance system, which means that uh, there were gyros involved. There was also a call, uh, something called a stable platform uh, where these gyros were installed uh, and it held accelerometers and things like that, that once the missile was launched, uh, these accelerometers would provide data to the computer to calculate speed and, and also direction uh, and so it was a, one of the theories by Boeing, and they did a bench test, um, was that uh, this stable platform was simply uh, uh, disrupted to the point where uh, uh, it, was, it was useless as far as calculating the uh, position of the missile after launch and therefore could not be launched. Um, this is one statement, again, from an official document we received. It was the opinion of the team, this was the Air Force investigative team, that externally generated signals. Um, it's wide ranging. The generation of the two channels and shutdown of the launch facilities. The possibility of this is very remote due to the fact that all 10 couplers would have to fail in the flight within a few seconds of each other. So, to extrapolate a little bit, the missiles were not interconnected in this way 
uh, they all had individual separate inertial guidance systems. So what this is saying is each of those guidance systems would have had to been uh, externally, there uh, had to be an external signal to each one separately mm. within seconds of each other in order for this to happen, a near impossibility. So it's intelligent uh, cause. One of the uh, individuals that contacted us after I went public was Robert Kaminsky. Uh, he was the head of the Boeing investigative team that went out to the uh, Echo Flight facilities. Uh, and he, here's what he states. There were no significant failures, engineering data, or findings that would explain how 10 missiles were knocked off alert. The final report would have nothing significant in it to explain what happened at Echo Flight. I was contacted by a representative and told by him the incident report as being a UFO event. A few days later, we were told uh, to stop any further effort on this project. We were also told um, we were not to submit a final engineering report. This was told to them by the Air Force. Uh, this was most unusual since all of our work required review by a customer, uh, by the customer and submittal of a final engineering report. Uh, there was a good reason for this, why the Air Force told them to cease and desist their investigation. And I'll get into that in a minute. Right now, I want to talk about the belt sighting, which happened on March 24th, 1967. Uh, basically, uh, a truck driver was driving through the town of Belt, about uh, 30 miles, um, I think, south of Great Falls. Uh, he looks uh, out to his left side, uh, and there he sees a bright white uh, object uh, tr tracking him uh, and pacing him, actually the same speed, 40 or 50 miles an hour. He stopped. The light hovered over uh, that photograph on the right is called Frenchman's Cooley, right near Belt. Uh, it hovered over that Cooley, uh, three blight fresh flashes of light, and then um, it landed in the Cooley. Uh, the truck driver called the highway patrol. Uh, patrolman Bud Nader came out. He also saw the object there, uh, landed at the Cooley, and they both saw the object rise up from the cooling and fly off. No and, sound. Uh, and then they called the uh, Air Force and the Sheriff's Office. They also came to the site, saw the object come back uh, and land again. Uh, it landed, uh, broke some tree branches, which were later discovered. Now this was seen by many civilian military witnesses. In fact, even over Melson Air Force Base, uh, there were articles written in the newspapers um, and the reason I bring this up uh, is because of my next witness, uh, Robert Jameson. He was on active duty Air Force from 1965 to 1972. While on active duty, he commanded the ICBM combat targeting team at Malmstrom Air Force Base from 65 to 67. He served as a missile targeting instructor at Chinook Air Force Base from 67 to 70 and as a targeting section commander at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota from 1970 to 72. He later worked as a traffic engineer for the California Department of Transportation, uh, Captain Jameson. Was a combat targeting officer at Mobstrom Air Force Base during the incident that we're talking about tonight, or this afternoon. Principally, my job was to point the missile in the right direction. It involves more than that, it involves smoke and mirrors and a whole bunch of other stuff. But generally, it's to point the direction, tell the missile which way to go. And also, if a missile falls off alert for no reason whatsoever, we have to go back and completely retarget it because we don't know what caused the missile to go off alert and whether or not it corrupted the targeting information. So we had to do the, do the whole thing over again. I was on alert one night and I got a call from job control. Job control is the people that keep track of all maintenance. And a missile had gone down in Oscar flight. He asked me to go and start it up. Well, that's bad news because Oscar flight is 160 miles from the base. And 160 miles on those Air Force trucks, no. So I had to go out anyway and did 
uh, restart the missile. When I got to the hangar after I called my team ready to get ready to go, I walked into the hangar and some of my friends came up and says, Bob, you hear what happened? No, I didn't hear what happened. It says there was a UFO, the sheriff in Roy, Montana, the little burg outside Lewiston, Montana. Roy, Montana reported a UFO in the area, told the Air Force, and at the same time, 10 missiles in Oscar flight went off alert. Well, this is very, very unusual. It's, I don't know if there's any incidents where two missiles went off alert at the same time, but the missiles would go off alert for no reason at all. It doesn't happen, really. We do take missiles off alert for maintenance and other, other reasons, but to go off alert for no reason. They're using intelligent design and principles here. Go off alert? It never happened before. Well, it happened a week before that. And Bob was the launch commander at that time. So they sent me out. But the, first of all, they gave me the targeting information. I told you, you aren't going to start one target. You're going to start four targets or four missiles. And he said, but don't leave yet. We're going to have to wait until all the activity out there is uh, dies down. But they told me there was also a flying saucer or a truck driver going down Bat Valt Canyon and reported a UFO. And we have a group out there right now involving the wing commander and some other big wheels just watching it. It's at the bottom of a canyon now. They can't send anybody. It's nighttime. They aren't going to send anybody down to the canyon at nighttime. They aren't going to send any helicopters down at the nighttime. But when, as soon as it gets light, they're going to do that. As soon as it got light and the helicopter started going down, the thing shot up between the two and disappeared. So that's uh, near Belt, Montana. And well, the shooting up stuff again that also leads us to uh evidence uh when they do stuff that defies the laws of physics um uh leads us why one of the reasons why we uh we believe it's interdimensional bob let's talk a little bit about that too but uh, getting back to the uh, uh missiles that uh you put back on alert and the next day, I was out on again, and I was talking to one of the, what we call a strike team, they're airmen, military, air, air, air police, plus security, yeah. And he was, to, he was out at the site during the, the previous night. And he's telling me, uh, well, uh, I said, did you see anything? Is yes, I remember seeing way out in this distance. There's a red dot. But I can see the red dot getting bigger and bigger and bigger and again coming closer and closer and closer. All of a sudden a few miles out, it sped into two dots. And it came right over top of me and, and, and then this guy started breaking down and I says, Okay, forget about it. And I understand uh, there are several more than one uh, these guys are just right out of high school, so they're very young. And breaking so apart by what happened again, that shows interdimensional, which is a good, good thing. But the most important thing, even though I never saw a flying saucer or a UFO, I do know they exist because they have a well, they knocked down our missiles. That just doesn't happen every day. All right, I'm going to skip a little. And that's really why we're, why we're here today. The nation depends upon this. I don't think they're going to destroy. I'm not, I'm not uh, scared of them. But I'm just kind of concerned. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, has had difficulty walking, and uh, it was very... Uh, I'm going to get into my my incident. Uh, the Oscar flight shut down, and again, uh, Robert uh, just 
validated the fact that it happened on March 24th, 1967. That's how we were able to come up with that date. And this was just, again, eight days after the Echo flight shut down. Uh, at first, I thought I was at Echo because the it seemed uh, the way it was described um, uh, it seemed like that's where I was. But when I spoke with my commander in the capsule at the time, and this is Colonel Fred Mywald, you see on the on the right hand side there, um, he informed me that no, we were not at Echo Flight, uh, we were at Oscar Flight which is a different flight altogether. But uh, as you can see from those diagrams, uh, all the flights look pretty much the same. So let me play this. <laughs> Our side of it. <laughs> yeah. All right, Here, here's the sequence I remember. I remember receiving a call first and, and the security guard said, uh, I've seen some UFOs up here flying around. And I said, uh, forget it. You know, I didn't believe them. I kind of hung up on him, and then a little while later, I don't know how long it was, maybe five, ten minutes, maybe longer, uh, they called back, and the guy sounded real scared, and said there was one just outside the front gate, and uh, he's, he also said, I recall, that uh, one of the other guards had gotten injured in some way. I, I, don't, I don't think it was from the UFO, I think it was from uh, trying to climb the fence, something like that uh, and then I hung up or he hung up because he had to go his guard got injured and then and then I believe you were either getting up or I woke you up and then some of our missiles started shutting down is that right mm -hmm. is that about how you remember it right yeah. we got the security alarms and, uh, yeah problems in a couple of the uh, sites yeah Okay. Well, I'm sure glad I found you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, contacted uh, Colonel Mywald finally in uh, 1996. That's when we had that conversation. And then, uh, uh, so just to recap, uh, I got two calls that night. First call, uh, lights in the sky from the flight security controller upstairs. Uh, Strange uh, maneuvers, not an airplane, sir. No engine noise, can't fly that fast, making 90 degree turns, not stopping any... on a dime, reversing course. All evidence that we're dealing with something not from within our physical universe, but defying the laws of physics, 90 degree turns, things like this uh, show it's interdimensional. That kind of thing. Not an airplane, sir. And I kind of said, what, what do you mean, UFOs? And he said, well, I can't explain it. And I kind of shrugged, shrugged it off and hung up. Uh, the next time he called, he was very, very uh, frightened. I could tell by his voice. He was, uh, he was shouting into the phone, uh, screaming and saying that there's this lighted uh, object about 40 feet in diameter uh, it looked like an oval shape but he couldn't be sure because it was so bright a bright orange a red orange light pulsating had the guards all out there with their weapons drawn uh, wanted me to tell them what to do next uh, at that point i did think we were under some kind of an attack i told him make sure the place was secure uh, and then he said he had to go one of his guards got injured it turns out the guard had cut his hand on barbed wire uh, around the fenced area. And uh, uh, and that's what happened there. Uh, and then we also got indicator lights um, uh, showing incursions at a couple of launch facilities. So that's what this next conversation is about. So if I can get it going. Any reports from the field about UFOs? So I remember the two guards had gone out to one of the sites, and uh, he finally got back scared to death, and we had to relieve him of duty. Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, our guards? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and the patrol tank. Oh, I see. He had gone out to one of the sites, uh, one of the 
KLF and on the way back we lost radio contact and we ended up having to send them back to base earlier. I'm not sure what happened, but I don't think they ever returned to uh, guard duty. And what were they scared about? Well, they had seen me some crazy things. And oh, they, they did? Had, yeah. Did they reported that to you? I, I, they reported it to the top side guy. Oh, the top side guy, that's right. Okay. 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 Well, interesting, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah unfortunately, Colonel Marwald passed about 10 years ago. Uh, what was going on at this time was the Condon investigation. In 1966, around August of 66, the University of Colorado uh, was given a uh, a contract by the Air Force and uh, to study the UFO question at uh, Air Force bases. Uh, in, the, in the statement of the contract, uh, which was no bid, by the way, uh, it was uh, stated that uh, the con investigators would have access to all UFO reports. That means all Blue Book reports, of course, uh, but they were not told that Blue Book had classified reports. Um, at any rate, uh, at the time of the Echo and Oscar flight incidents, uh, this man here to the top left, uh, Ray Fowler, was a manager for Sylvania. Sylvania had an electro electrical systems contract with the Air Force on the Minuteman One system. So he had representatives at Malmstrom Air Force Base who actually saw uh, these objects and, um, and talked to some of the principals involved. Uh, so Ray Fowler called uh, the chief investigator for Condon, a man by the name of Roy Craig, and we were able to retrieve some of Craig's uh, notes, which are, are held in archives at one of the universities. I think it's Texas A&M, if I'm not mistaken. But at any rate, in one of the notes, uh, obviously he took when he talked to Fowler, uh, again, the date of March 24th, is named uh, only a, for the shutdown of Echo, but we know Echo happened on March 16th because of that telegram we have. But he states March 24th, which was probably a reference to Oscar flight. He then writes a letter to uh, Robert Lowe, who's the deputy of Condon, uh, and tells him that uh, he has heard that these incidents occurred, uh, Echo and Oscar losing all 10 missiles to UFOs, and uh, should we follow up on this? Well, Robert Lowe writes back and says, uh, "Yeah, oh, this uh, classified report is going to be uh, too high for us to look at. So uh, besides, they told us that uh, it was probably a nuclear test that caused the missiles to shut down because they gave off EMP when, whenever there's uh, a nuclear test. Well." We actually checked. Actually, my um, investigator, James Klotz, who's... Uh, oh, so, would the nuclear weapons turn off if there was an EMP? I guess the UFOs could uh, mimic that. Terrific investigator. Uh, checked with AEC, and they said there were no nuclear tests at the time. So, uh, but what happened here was that uh, the... Condon investigators simply dropped the ball here. They, they no longer investigated the Echo or Oscar flight incidents, even though they had names, lots of names of people to talk to, including the two crews, uh, et cetera. And as a result, as was previously mentioned, uh, the Air Force issued this fact sheet in, uh, I think, January of 1969, uh, Blue Book canceled. Uh, based on the Condon scientific study. Well, it wasn't a scientific study. Condon himself admitted this in a, an interview uh, to a physics magazine. I've got a, um, a transcript of that interview uh, and stated uh, they didn't look at any hypothesis. They didn't try to prove anything. It was not a scientific study. And Again, as was stated, no UFO reported investigated by the Air Force was ever an indication of threat to our national security. Uh, and this is a blatantly false statement. The Air Force knew it. They know it today. They know it's a false statement because... 
they, again, you don't want to let the Russians know that the UFOs are taking your stuff offline. They did an investigation on it, and somewhere in the archives of the Air Force is a classified investigation of Echo and Oscar flights. Uh, we even have a reference to that, uh, a name of the uh, investigative report. Uh, and so they have blatantly lied to the public since 1969 about the fact that these incidents were, in fact, national security related. I'm going to turn now real quickly to um, uh, the story of Major Bradford Runyon, Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, 1968. He was a co-pilot of B-52 coming back to land at Mount uh, Minot <clears throat> when it was ordered by a general officer to uh, go around and fly around this launch facility, uh, part of the Minot missile field. And uh, and just look, uh, see if you can see, see something down there. So he did, um, and uh, this diagram at right, uh, on the right side is a result. It shows an object on the ground, um, an orange uh, color uh, with a kind of a tunnel between that and a kind of a, a crescent-shaped uh, part of it, uh, which was colored a very bright green. Uh, these were the colors he, he described. Uh, anyway, I'll play the testimony here of uh, uh, Major Runyon. Uh, uh, and Lauren goes out from one of the missile silos. Then, uh, Oh, uh, uh, and Lauren goes out from one of the missile silos. I'm sorry, I'm just going to. And, uh, oh, uh, uh, and Lauren goes out from one of the missile silos. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, so, uh, uh, turns out that, uh, missile stuff was told to us at the briefing by General Officer the following day. So, uh, uh, air police were dispatched to, uh, check on the missile alarm and, uh, so the first air policeman that was sent out didn't check in when they should have, so they sent others to check on them. And the, the second group found the first group unconscious around their vehicle with a paint burned off the top of their vehicle. And uh, that sort of stuff, there's going to be a connection to Fatima. Um, there's like radiation sort of things that happen with UFOs. This is common. When I came to, I don't want to say common, but not unheard of with UFO sightings. Uh, people falling asleep and this sort of thing, also common. They, uh, they said that, uh, you know, something, some object, had, uh, they thought I was going to sit down on top of them. And uh, so they started running as last that they knew, but uh, it didn't squash their vehicle or anything, so it didn't sit down on them. And, uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, it turns out that uh, the reason that the uh, alarms were set off was a 20 ton concrete lid covering the top of the missile silo had been removed. And uh, the impressive. around the thing had been squashed. There was radio radioactivity around. And uh, uh, the inner alarm uh, down inside the silo had also been activated. Well, it turns out that the uh, uh, there were two ways to remove the, uh, the concrete lid. You either have a, a large crane that lift 20 tons and set it off to the side, or have explosive charges that uh, blow it off in case one launches the missile and go to war. Explosive charges haven't been activated. But, so these things aren't on a mechanism that... No, work. no, huh? They're just... Well, it, it's just sitting, it's just a, a big concrete lid that's sitting so on top of it. If they were to fire that missile, man, they have to blow that... No, they blow it off, yeah. So, but the thing was moved to the side. Yeah, it was just off to the side someplace. It wasn't on top of the, the missile silo anyway. Now, and the cha there's a chain link fence yes, uh -huh. tight around the silo? Uh, well, just, just to keep, uh, mainly keep animals out, and I guess people. And uh, But a part of it had been uh, flattened, just squashed. And there weren't any, any tracks around other than, you know, just right there, chain link fence. Now, now we want to point out that the, mm -hmm. the written a color of this sighting doesn't say anything. No, uh, no, it, this is just told to us. Oh, that was probably such of uh, an important nature to the Air Force as uh, the, the cause of the uh, the missile being, being checked out. Hmm. Uh, this is a very well researched incident. Uh, 
And I would advise uh, any, any of you who are interested in following up and getting more details to go to this website here. They're uh, just like begging the press. The uh, but like I to said, be interested. a lot of work was done, uh, not only with Major Runyon, but there were other witnesses to this. Is the press even interested? I mean, the one guy in the Washington Examiner is, at least he showed up on Tucker, but uh why aren't more uh very well researched i'm gonna i'm gonna move on quickly since we're running out of time uh to captain bruce fenstermacher again he uh testified at the citizens hearing on disclosure and, and there's the website you can go to to uh, see more of that hearing and uh and here is uh captain fenstermacher i was a captain in the air force and a Minuteman three combat crew commander from 1974 to 1977. I was stationed at F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming and assigned to the 400th Strategic Missile Squadron. In the fall of 76, my deputy and I were on duty at the Romeo Launch Facility, or LCF. Approximately 2 a.m., the FSC called the SAT and said, hey, pull over. Get out of the vehicle and look around. That's all he said. Gave no direction or any guidance. A few seconds, and he also said, see what you see. A few seconds later, the, they reported they saw nothing, and they said, oops, but wait a minute, we do see something in the distance. You have to see, well, what do you see? And they said it was, they said in an excited voice, it was a light in the sky, it was a bright white pulsating light, and they could see some other colors in between the pulsations. The FSC asked them where the light was located, and the reply was that it was some... Multiple color stuff also. Uh, I've read about that uh, in other contexts for UFOs. This is to the north, and then after a pause, they said, geez, it really looks like it's near the LCF, or near where you are. The FSC then asked the SAT to return back to the launch control facility. My deputy and I kind of looked at each other and did a double take because... What the heck was that all about? So we called the FSC on our hotline and asked them what was going on. He very calmly said that right, right now, right above the LCF, there was a silent object with a very red, light pulsating light. Between the pulsations, he could see a red and blue. I asked for specifics and his best guess. Multiple colors. Well, he said it was a fat cigar. It looked like a fat cigar. And cigar his best shape guess was that it was 80 to 100 feet above the ground and 40 to 50 feet long it was hard to see i mean you get all sorts of different shapes exactly. of ufos but cigar shape is a common one if it was way high it could have been a and when i say common i mean not unheard of but that was his best guess right after the group communication the crew from quebec quebec called they were the team we had dropped off on the way to romeo and said that earlier that morning they had a similar object above a couple of their launch facilities. Okay, I'm gonna cut it a little short there. Um, the next area I'd like to talk about is uh, nuclear weapons storage bases, uh, NATO bases, um, uh, starting from the, some sometime in the 70s until- I really would like to uh, hear if Soviets had anything similar. Or the Chinese, I guess, even though I don't know if the Chinese would uh, share that sort of thing. Possibly the present time. Uh, and this was a, a quote I have from uh, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists. It's a, a well-known group that monitors nuclear weapons uh, activity throughout the world. It says at the peak of the Cold War, more than 7,000, as many as 24 different types of tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons were deployed by the United States through the NATO framework in Europe. The role of the weapons was to buttress deterrence of Soviet military strike by countering a uh, perception that after the Warsaw Pact, NATO conventional forces were inferior to Soviet conventional forces. Some of the U.S. tactical nuclear weapons, uh, which were stationed in Belgium, Germany, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, Turkey, and the United Kingdom are still there. Uh, so this is just a validation of the fact that we had technical. Now these 
tactical nuclear weapons or smaller weapons are still about the size of the ones that uh, were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, I just want to point to three incidents. So there have been many. Uh, one at Aviano Air Base, Italy, in July of 1977. Um, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Roger Furry was on duty near uh, uh, what's called the Alert Facility, where they had uh, air uh, interceptor pi uh, pilots standing by in case needed. Um, and, uh, this lighted object comes over, a very bright light. Um, hovers over that facility uh, or nearby, uh, and again, uh, just flies off. Um, <clears throat> he said the light had a strong glare. It made it difficult to describe the shape of the object as it hovered. The light changed from yellow to orange to red in a gradual manner. Hmm. I hear a humming sound like bees buzzing. There was also a high amount of static electricity in the air. And you the object appeared to be about 7,500 feet in diameter. Sergeant Curry and others observed it for about five minutes. The next one, Schusterberg, uh, Schusterberg Air Base, the Netherlands, February 2nd. Uh, a young teenager named uh, Josie Zwinnenberg was riding her horse uh, next to the, uh, the base and saw very clearly uh, this a very large UFO hovering uh, right near the fence uh, that would connect to the base. The next day, uh, there were 12 witnesses at the air base as this object. You see a, a sketch that was described, <clears throat> and it flew down the flight line, observed by 12 witnesses who went on the radio, by the way, that evening and talked about this. <laughs> They, uh, the te the, that testimony uh, is available, again, a transcript of that testimony, the actual audio of those witnesses describing this object flies slowly down the flight line, shining a beam of light, uh, apparently uh, uh, pointing out the uh, storage of the nuclear weapons on base. The next one uh, I'll talk about is RAF Bentwaters, United Kingdom, right around Christmas time, 1980. And uh, Colonel Ch uh, Charles Halt was a principal witness to that. In 2010, he gave a uh, he gave us an affidavit. And I'll just read from that. This object then moved back towards Bentwaters and continued to send down beams of light. At one point near the uh, the beams of light thing is reminding me of the mystery airships uh, doing the beams of light thing in the late 1800s in North America. Weapon storage area. In keeping with official Air Force policy, I can neither confirm or deny that the weapons storage area held nuclear weapons. However, I am aware that other former or retired Air Force security police who worked there at the time of the incident are now on the record confirming the presence of tactical nuclear bombs at the weapons storage area. So we'll... Uh, that's the end of the testimony that we're going to present today. I just want to, again, commend Robert Hastings. He literally wrote the book, UFOs and Nukes. Hmm. I would highly recommend. Yeah, I might have to get that. Again, if you're serious about this subject, to read that. All right, I'm going to be and skipping. finally, um, some concluding remarks. Um, uh, I fully realize the acceptance of the reality of this phenomenon as a giant leap for a lot of people. We all tend to be comfortable with what we already imagine if you had the interdimensional portion on top of this. What do you think we know and don't want to rock the boat or change our perceptions of things? But we humans have had to deal with all sorts of new things in our evolutionary path in the coming days and months. Oh, evolutionary path going with aliens. I think we'll all have to deal with this reality because there is abundant and sober evidence press past and present yes the reality of uap it's undeniable not aliens though it is not swamp gas i agree or any other quirk of nature indeed the evidence that there is some intelligence and intent behind the uap yes has been established by the testimonies we presented and many more which have yet to be presented yes with the recent ODNI report, even our government has now publicly acknowledged its reality. The question is, can we finally get the court of public opinion 
to consider and accept it? Can we all give it the attention it deserves? I think so. Everything else that deserves our attention. There's still a lot of skeptics. The whole fact is whether we like it or not, whether it is convenient or not, the UAP reality is here. And by the way, nuclear weapons are our own inventive way we use to terminate one war. It is also a way that we could be used for the complete annihilation of humanity <clears throat> and other life on Earth. In my opinion, and just my opinion, UFOs are simply reminding us that we should seriously try to eliminate these weapons. I don't think we have no idea. We want to be looking through keyholes to know what our government is unnecessarily hiding from us. We they do need to hide nuclear hearings. capabilities. So let us hear from other witnesses, government agencies, and anyone else who has been holding these secrets. We have a critical need to know. I don't know how Thank critical it is. And, uh, uh, we'll entertain questions uh, in the time we have left. All right, I might skip her in soon. Uh, yes. Thank you for doing this, by the way. Um, great presentation. Um, considering the fact that these guys have basically been lying for the past 80 years, are you somewhat concerned with the threat narrative that's being created now? Meaning the effect that that's still going to have on the public or, for that matter, governmental policy going forward? I mean, because you mentioned here that you don't necessarily think it's a threat. You think it's more along the lines of this kind that's of good question. nuclear weapons are dangerous, you guys are going to kill yourself, et cetera, et cetera. But the narrative that these guys are creating is pretty much unverifiable. It's coming from government sources and the government is basically the one that's saying this is what is taking place. Does that concern you going forward? Well, again, like I said originally, we're not trying to prove anything. This is not a scientific exercise uh, or a mathematical proof demonstration or anything like that. What we are doing and what all these witnesses have had, who've had the courage to come forward are doing is simply telling their stories. Uh, we have stated, yes, that the government has withheld secrets intentionally. And now I think uh, All right, the next question is, how will the air... Yes. Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, you had mentioned the ODNI report from June. And of course, the larger context here is the relatively newer witnesses and yeah. um, film evidence that we've gotten from the Navy, from the Nimitz in 2004, and then mm -hmm. the training areas in the Atlantic uh, more recently. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or feelings about that. Do you feel like you've been ignored? And what do you think has been the change? Why, why do you think things are suddenly different and you we have Washington taking this so seriously now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll give it a try and then ask these other guys if they want to comment. <clears throat> have we been ignored? Well, uh, I've been st uh, speaking about this for about 25 years or more. So, yeah, this is the fifth time, <laughs> at least the fifth time I've spoken at this venue on this very particular subject. Um, I, You know, the, the media took it seriously each time they they wrote uh columns they wrote uh, uh and there was commentary written about it uh uh and then they seemed to get lost the subject seemed to kind of go away yeah the reason it's different this time and and you put your finger on it i think is those videos released by the navy uh through the help of i think lou elizondo and uh, chris mellon uh we have to commend them for getting those released um, and the Navy admitting, uh, yeah, this something happened here uh, we can't explain. And you heard from the pilots, right? Uh, so that's different. And also the statement that I quoted from the ODNI report uh, stating that these probably represent real objects. Uh, so that's the first time I've ever heard a government official make a statement like that in my lifetime. Uh, you guys want to add anything? No? Uh, did I answer your question, sir?
shut up. We've been silenced. We've been ridiculed. We've, we've had our... Yeah, our I'm skipping this. You'll notice, by the way, that we're all pretty old, which means that our testimony is, is going to go away in, in real time here. What I've discovered since I got old is that old people have a super power. We're invisible. Nobody pays any attention to us. We're just old timers and old goats. And what do we know? What we've told you today, what you've heard from, from these three guys and from this old bird out here in the Ozarks, is that this is the real thing that's happening to us. I saw it with my own eyes on film, the film that I was in charge of taking in Big Sur, California. That UFO knocked one of our dummy nuclear warheads out of space. It shot it down. To me, that looks like a, a shot across the bow from a superior force going, hey, knock it off. And for, for our government, for the U.S. Air Force... Who knows what their intent is, but that is not an unreasonable... Uh, um, I just don't trust them. I just don't trust them, but not an unreasonable conclusion. Part of our government, at any rate, in my case, to shut it up, to silence it, to tell me it never happened, to say, shut up, don't talk about it, in any case, our government is is uh, lying to us. Uh, do they have they lied to us in the past? Well, let me see. Remember the Vietnam conflict? Remember Robert McNamara? Remember all that business about oh peace with honor and all that crap that came out of uh, our government? Robert McNamara just a few years ago came out and said that Vietnam was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it. Isn't he dead? We were, we were lied to for we're. Con- didn't even to be lied to. I, I told you this is not about politics. I don't believe in politics when it comes to UFOs. I don't. I, you folks are all sitting there wearing masks and all that stuff. Well, these are a bug or is it not a bug? That isn't what this is about. This is about something that's more important than I can possibly explain to you. It's about the possibility of our survival. If these guys, if these things, if these creatures from wherever they are or whatever time they are or whatever place they are, get mad at us enough. They can annihilate our entire species just like that. Unless they're under the control of God in a spiritual hierarchy. They have the technology and the power that we can't even imagine. Their, that I would their agree with. science is to us magic. Or th- their magic is to you science. Magic, quote unquote. Yeah, I think we've probably been entitled to some of that information, but I'm telling you folks in the press, we need to get Congress to listen to us. We need to get the message out to people that, okay, we're old and invisible, but the facts that we're telling you are terribly, terribly important. Bob? Thank you, Robert. Yes, Billy Cox. Can't hear him. Well, I'll uh, refer you to Mr. Hastings again. I, I know he was in contact with certain individuals. Again, these are... No idea uh, what this are, question is, so skip them. And did not want to come forward. Uh, uh, if we had OPEC, there is... And uh, Laura uh, Force has admitted uh, 50 missiles shut down. Uh, that's about all I'll say to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, how you doing? Uh, thank you, David, and the three Roberts for doing this. Uh, so my... <laughs> My question here is, is uh, two points I would like to touch on here. Uh, we've heard in this subject, uh, the CIA, DIA, and, and now the Navy branch of the military that has been in, encountered with this uh, UAP phenomenon. Surprisingly, um, the branch that you represent, the Air Force, and the Air Force intelligence has been really quiet, or I haven't seen any data come from this branch specifically. So. Where's the pre- that we need to have pressure there at some point to to uncover whatever data they've been sitting on for decades. Uh, that's one point. The second point you just touched on is there's something that's happened more recently around nuclear facilities that we probably won't hear of for another 10, 20 years as people start retiring or coming right. off their command shifts that have happened. Um, All right, I'm skipping. You guys want to respond to that? Well, you're right. I was active for five years. Um, right, you're, you're trained to it could be serious trouble, and there are people right. Um, I waited 40 years that this 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm skipping over that. It was a good question. Hey, um, I think Mr. Bassett deserves the last question, but we're going to have to cut it after that. I don't know if I deserve it, Bob, but uh, Steve Bassett, Paradigm Research Group. Uh, the officers from the key early incidents, obviously, are in their 80s, early to mid 80s, and many of them have passed. Now, the security personnel, topside, the younger fellows are now in their early 70s. Uh, many of them actually saw the crash. Are you aware of any of these security fellows that were up top? That That's a good question. And willing to come and testify before Congress. Uh, okay, Mr. Um, I'm not aware if they're prepared to testify before Congress, but I've talked to a couple of security guards uh, in person, um, and uh, they're very intimidated to come out and speak, um, especially one of them that I uh, understand works for the State Department, and uh, you can understand the, the considerations he has to make. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have... All right, well, that's it. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I'll try to post the link uh, in a pinned comment of my main UFO video that I would want you to watch. Um, I also have a playlist, uh, which this will be a part of. So check out my playlist. All right, God bless. Um, thanks, uh, everybody who participated, and have a good night.